morning. I welcome members to the 23rd meeting in 2015 of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. As always, ask members to switch off mobile phones, please. Agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. It's proposed the committee takes item 11 and 12 in private. Item 11 will allow the committee to consider its approach to the scrutiny of the Land Reform Scotland Bill at stage one. And item 12 will come to consideration by the committee of the written evidence received on the Succession Scotland Bill. Does the committee agree to take both those items in private, please? Yes. Thank you. Agenda item two is instruments subject to affirmative procedure. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Scotland Act 1999. 1998, modification of schedules four and five, order 2015 draft, nor on the Scottish Parliament disqualification, order 2015 draft. Is the committee content with those instruments, please? Yes. Agenda item three, instruments subject to negative procedure, the Westerost Marine Conservation Order 2015, SSI 2015 302. This instrument was laid before the Parliament on the 17th of August and came into force force on the 18th of August. The requirement to leave a minimum of 28 days between laying and coming into force has therefore not been complied with. It was brought into force urgently due to a breach of the voluntary management arrangement for the Westeros Marine Protected Area. Does the committee agree to draw the instrument to, to the attention of the Parliament under uh, reporting ground J as there has been a failure to observe the requirements of section 28.2 of the Interpretation and Legislative Reform Scotland Act 2010? Does the committee accept the Scottish Government's explanation as to why the 28-day rule has been breached? Yes. Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Town and Country Planning Hazardous Substances Inquiry Session Procedure, Scotland Amendment Rules 2015, SSI 2015, 250, nor on the Adults Within Capacity Public Guardians Fees, Scotland Regulations 2015, SSI 2015, 260, nor on the Court of Session, etc., fees, Order 2015, SSI 2015, 261. Nor on the High Court of Judiciary Fees Order 2015, SSI 2015, 262. Nor the Justice of the Peace Court Fees Scotland Order 2015, SSI 2015, 263. Nor the Sheriff Court Fees Order 2015, SSI 2015, 264 nor the Public Bodies Joint Working Integration Joint Board Establishment Scotland Amendment No. 2, Order 2015, SSI 2015, 266, nor the South Arran Marine Conservation Order 2014, Urgent Continuation Order SS 2015, SSI 2015, 303, nor lastly on the Queen Margaret University Edinburgh Scotland Amendment Order of Council 2015, SSI 2015, 305. Is the committee content with these, please? Yes. Yep. Agenda item four, instruments not subject to any parliamentary procedure. The Act of a Journal Criminal Procedure Rules 1996 Amendment Number 4, Sheriff Appeal Court 2015, SSI 2015 245. This instrument contains some minor drafting errors. Firstly, in paragraph 29, the references in the substituted rule 1911-1A and B of the Criminal Procedure Rules 1996 to sections 1799 and 1879A should be followed by the words of the Act of 1995. Secondly, in paragraph 3, the reference to section 194ZF2A in the inserted rule 19E41 should be followed by the words of the Act of 1995. Thirdly, in paragraph 523B, the reference to paragraph 4 of Form 38 should instead re refer to paragraph 5. And lastly, in form 19E2, which is inserted by the schedule, the reference to rule 19E24 should instead refer to rule 19E25. The Law President's private office has laid an instrument, SSI 2015 295, to correct the errors ahead of the instrument coming into force, and this amending instrument will be considered later on the agenda. However, does the committee agree to draw this instrument to the attention of the Parliament on the general reporting ground as it contains some minor drafting errors? Yes. Thank you. No points have been raised by our legal advisers on the Act of a Journal Criminal Procedure Rules 1996 Amendment Number 4, Sheriff Appeal Court. 
2015, SSI 2015-245. Nor on the Housing Scotland Act 2014, commencement number three, and transitional provisions order 2015, SSI 2015-272. Nor the Act of Adjournal Criminal Procedure Rules 1996, and Act of Adjournal Criminal Procedure Rules 1996, amendment number four, Sheriff Appeal Court 2015, amendment miscellaneous 2015, SSI 2015-295 nor the Act of Sederant Ordinary Cause Rules 1993, Amendment and Miscellaneous Amendments 2015, SSI 2015-296. Is the committee content with those instruments, please? <coughs> Agenda item five is the Health, Tobacco, Nicotine, etc. and Care Scotland Bill. The purpose of this item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bill at stage one. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the Scottish Government on the delegated powers in the bill in written correspondence. The committee will have the opportunity to consider those responses at a future meeting before the draft report is then considered. Section 3.1 confers a power for ministers to issue guidance on age verification policy. Section 3.1 inserts Section 4.B.5 into the Tobacco and Primary Medical Services Scotland Act 2010. Subsection 1B of that new section 4B refers to the requirements for a person to operate a an age verification policy in respect of premises at which the person carries on a tobacco or nicotine vapour product business. And I may later refer to nicotine vapour products as NVPs. Subsection 3 enables an age older than 25 to be specified in that policy. Subsection 5 of the new section lists various matters on which the Scottish Ministers may publish guidance relating to age verification policies. It appears that other matters than those listed might be included in guidance, but the list does not include guidance as to what should be considered before any person decides to specify any age older than 25 in their policy. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government one, to clarify whether it is intended that a person operating an age verification policy in relation to a tobacco or NVP business should have complete discretion to determine any age older than 25 that may be specified in their policy for the purposes of subsection 3 or section 4b. Two, to clarify whether it is intended that the guidance issued by ministers under subsection 5 should or should not include guidance on how any such older age may be determined. And three, whether therefore the new section 4b could be clearer in providing for the intentions which underline the provisions. That was actually a set of questions. You are happy with it? Yes, thank you. Section 17.1 enables ministers by regulations to make provision prohibiting or restricting an activity in the course of business which relates to an NVP advert or NVP brand sharing. The Delegated Powers Memorandum acknowledges that this power is widely drawn. Further clarity on the subject of the power to regulate related activities might be beneficial. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government, one, why it's considered that the wide power in section 17.1 to make provision prohibiting or restricting an activity in the course of business which relates to an NVP advert or NVP brand sharing is appropriately drawn and could not be framed more transparently or narrowly to provide a description or list of activities relating to NVP advertising or brand sharing which may be included within the regulations. Two, what related activities it considers would be potentially within the scope of this power. And three, examples of the activities which the Scottish Government intends could be covered by these regulations. Yes. Okay. Subsection 2B and C of Section 17 enables the regulations under subsection 1 specifying offences to provide for exceptions and defences to such offences. There is currently no description or list of exceptions or defences to def offences which may be included in those regulations. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government, one, could the power in section 17 2b and c be drawn more transparently or precisely to include a description of the list of exceptions or list of exceptions or, or defences to offences which might be included in the regulations in accordance with the Scottish Government's intentions? albeit that the initial description or list might in future be modified by regulation. And two, otherwise, could it please explain why it has been considered appropriate to include the provisions in section 17 2D and E on enforcement, but not to include further provision as to exceptions and defences. Yes. Thank you. Section 18.1 of the bill enables ministers to make regulations to prohibit or restrict in the course of business the giving away of NVPs 
and coupons for these products for free, including retailing them for a nominal value. Section 19.1 enables regulations to prohibit or restrict a person in the course of their business entering into a sponsorship agreement where the purpose or effect of anything done as a result of the agreement provokes an MVP. Both section 18.2 and 19.2 contain a non-exhaustive list of the kind of provision which could be made in regulations, including enforcement, offences, defences and exceptions. There is currently no description or list of exceptions or defences to offences which might be included. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government, as far as the powers in section 17.2b and c, therefore, could sections 18.2 and 19.2 be drawn more transparently or precisely to include a description or list of exceptions or defences to offences, sorry, defences to offences, which may be included in the regulations in accordance with the Scottish Government's intentions, again, albeit that an initial description or list might in future be modified by regulation? Otherwise, could the government please explain why it has been considered appropriate to include the provisions in sections 18.2 E and F and 19.2 D and E on enforcement, but not include further provision as to exceptions and defences? Okay. Section 20 inserts section <coughs> 4D into the 2005 Act. Section 4D1 defines the meaning of a non-smoking area outside a building hospital. It's an area lying immediately outside a hospital building and bounded by a perimeter or a specified distance from that building. New section 4D2A enables ministers to make regulations to prescribe the specified distance of the perimeter. The Delegated Powers Memorandum explains that the perimeter distance to be specified under this power is a key aspect of the proposed policy. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government, one, for further explanation, as to why a proposed initial perimeter distance could not, following consultation on the bill, have been included in the proposed new section 4D of the 2005 Act for consideration by Parliament and consultation with stakeholders during the bill's stages. It appears possible to, to have been... Sorry, it appears possible to have provision that such an initially proposed distance might be variable by means of regulations. Why does the Scottish Government therefore consider it more appropriate for the distance to be proposed in regulations at a later date? Secondly, the DPM states that it is intended that the same perimeter distance of proposed non-smoking area is to apply to all NHS buildings. For consistency, paragraph 87, sorry, that's hospital buildings, not all buildings. However, the proposed new section 4D1 and 2 of the 2005 Act do not in terms provide that only one distance may be specified for the purpose of all health service hospital buildings. The ancillary powers in section 32.1 enable the regulations to make different provision for different purposes. The Scottish Government are therefore asked to consider whether the policy intention to prescribe a single perimeter distance could be made clearer in the provisions. Yes, yeah. Section 22.1 confers powers on ministers to specify the actions which could be taken by the responsible person, the duty of candour procedure. A responsible person is one of the bodies, including health boards, as defined in section 25, who provide health, care and social work services. Further information about why secondary, relation, secondary legislation is appropriate here and how it might be used might be beneficial. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government to, one, explain why it has been considered more appropriate to set out the whole duties of the DU sorry, the whole details of the duty of candour procedure in regulations under the framework of particular matters that might be included as set out in sections 22, 2A to K, and two, to provide examples of how this power might be exercised to set out specific procedures and requirements on a responsible person. In particular, could examples be provided of the type of actions, steps and requirements that might be required of a responsible person under section 22, 2D, G or I. Yes. Okay. The wording of the ancillary powers in section 33.1 differs from, for example, that in section 97.1 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill as passed. Yet different words, uh, wording is used in section 25 of the Succession Scotland Bill, which the committee is also currently considering. Does the committee therefore agree to ask the Scottish Government to explain why the different wordings used in section 33.1 is appropriate and what the effect of the provision is compared with the formulations used in the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill and the Succession Scotland Bill? Does the committee agree that if the effect of ancillary powers in different bills is intended to be the same, 
and the same wording ought to be used for consistency. John. Uh, well, you. Um, <laughs> uh, I, mean, I mean, I just wonder, I suppose, how important this is in that, you know, people say things in different ways, and, but they end up having the same meaning, or if it is really important that uh, we all have exactly the same wording in a different bills at the same time. So I just throw that in by way of comment. <clears throat> John. Throw it in by way of comment too, that if, if the words are different, then presumably they must have a different meaning in law thereafter uh, and be open to different interpretations. And I think it would make sense if the intentions are the same, would it not, that the words were consistent one with another? Shall we ask the question? It would seem reasonable that there's a catch-all set of words that would be in every statute and would be changed only when something was not meant to be caught. We shall ask the question. Thank you. Uh, agenda item six, Community Justice Scotland Bill. The purpose of this item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers provisions in the bill at stage one. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the Scottish Government on the delegated powers. Uh, the committee will have the opportunity to consider the responses at a future meeting before a draft report is then considered. Section 3.4 of the Bill makes provision for Scottish Ministers to confer additional functions on or transfer another person's functions to Community Justice Scotland. Section 3.5 provides that regulations made under Section 3.4 may modify any enactment. Delegated Powers Memorandum appears not to provide an explanation as to how these powers might be exercised. Does the committee agree to ask the Scottish Government in relation to the powers in section 3, 4, C and 5 why specifically it's the power to, be make, to make changes to the main functions of the community <coughs> pardon me, of Community Justice Scotland as listed in section 3, 1 appropriate and how might the Scottish Government exercise this power to modify that subsection? And secondly, which functions of the Community Justice Scotland described in section 3, 1 and elsewhere in the bill are functions in relation to community justice which may be changed by regulations. Would it be clear if the provisions set out which functions described in the bill could be changed and which could not be changed? Yes. Things brings us to agenda item seven, which is the Succession Scotland Bill. And the purpose of this item is for the committee to consider the delegated powers and only the delegated powers provisions in that bill at stage one. The committee is invited to agree the questions it wishes to raise with the Scottish Government. Uh, is we'll, we will have an opportunity to consider the responses at a future meeting before a draft meeting, uh, sorry, draft report is then considered. The wording of the ancillary powers in section 25.1 differs from, for example, that in section 97.1 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill as passed and as just discussed, does the committee therefore agree to ask the Scottish Government again to explain why there's a different formulation used in section 25.1 is appropriate, what the effect of the provision in comparison with the formulation used in, for example, section 97.1 of the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill might be. And does the committee again agree that the effect of ancillary powers in different bills, if it's intended to be tamed, then the same wording should be used? Yes. Thank you. Uh, agenda item eight. Agenda eight. Stuart, sorry. Uh, just on agenda item eight, convener, I think it would be appropriate for me to declare that as the uh, introducer of the bill you are about to uh, discuss, uh, I would not uh, take any part in this discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I take it that as the convener of the Scottish Parliamentary, convener of the relevant committee, the name of which I'm struggling for to... Thank procedures, you. public appointments. It's in that capacity that you're making that declaration. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, agenda item 8 is the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Amendment Bill, uh, and members are asked to consider the delegated powers contained in that bill. Um, if members are content with the recommendations in this paper, this will form the basis of report to the Parliament, and the draft report would not be discussed by the committee before it is published. Uh, is the committee content with the delegated power in section 17. We are. Does the committee agree to refer to the standards procedures of the Public Appointment Committee the following questions? Whether any changes to the standing orders are contemplated in implementation of the bill, implementation of the bill in light of the resolution making power in section 17 to include specific provision for appropriate parliamentary scrutiny 
of any such resolution. An example of such provision can be found in the standing orders in respect of motions seeking modification of the parliamentary pension scheme or grant scheme. And secondly, whether any changes to the standing orders are contemplated in respect of a resolution, resolution of the Scottish Parliament to change it the registrable interest set out in the schedule to the interests of members of the Scottish Parliament Act 2006 to include a specific provision for appropriate parliamentary scrutiny of any such resolution. Yes. Well, thank you. That takes us without more ado to agenda item number nine, which is the British Sign Language BSL Scotland Bill. The item of business again is consideration of delegated powers provisions in the bill after stage two. It's expected the stage three debate will take place in early September, therefore members should agree their conclusions today. After stage two, one power to make a subordinate legislation has been removed and another has been amended. Does the committee agree to report that it's content with the delegated powers in the bill as th which have been amended or removed at stage two? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Gender item 10, the Education Scotland Bill. The purpose of this item is considered the Scottish Government's response to the Committee's report on the Bill at Stage 1. The Government agreed with the Committee's recommendations and will bring forward amendments to the Bill to give these effect. And I'm really just asking members to note that. Thank you. At which point uh, we come to Agenda item 11 and I move the meeting into private.